But that's it. We're live. We are live. Thank you very much for coming. It's that's been it. it's been a fun fun morning. Um, having to watch this is going to go way out after the rugby result. It's not mm. going to be anywhere near it. So um, we can say well done, England. Yes. Yeah. What a game. It was pretty good. Who do you think? I think Toji. Toji was uh, probably one of the standout players yeah. for it. I think defensively, he just really kind of rose up. Him and uh, was it Underhill who put in that huge Underhill? Yeah. yeah, Underhill. I think Ben was saying on the uh, the chat that we had that Underhill was just like mm. one of the best of his position. Definitely. I mean, all the defense was just insane. It was good. We started out so well. That's mm. that's the thing that got me. Is just like the 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 confidence that we had straight out which just took the momentum all the way through the game, which mm. I thought was brilliant. So, yeah, I was, uh, I was really happy with that. So, that's it. So, welcome to my man cave. Very nice to be here. Sort of man cave. I mean, <laughs> I have to actually uh, tell people this, that, that ideally what I would be doing is I'd be actually um, showing you around my ideal kind of spot for what, what I do, my lighting and everything like that. But unfortunately, I've moved. And so my man cave didn't move with me. So I've, I've got it semi set up upstairs, mm. but I will put some effort in so that I can actually show you a little bit more of a cool little spot and everything. Mm. But so at the moment it's more of a kind of man dining room. It's more, yeah, at the moment it's man dining room. I mean, I have a piano in here and stuff, and which is fine, um, and TV, but it is very basic, a bit of vinyl, so that's quite manly. Um, but it's more kind of like the man cave is more of a... It's kind of like if you if I if I rob uh, the theme of a very popular BBC series of Desert Island Discs, it's almost like a man cave is like your desert island. Mm. So it's the one place where you have the where you can go and you can just enjoy what you want to enjoy. Mm. So it always comes with a leading question of like, well, okay, your man cave, what is it that you do? It's not paying bills. It's nobody asks you to do it. Something like that. Have you got a man cave or have you got that place or that passion that you would do? Now, so actually, I've already given you an intro into this so people know that you're a professional opera singer. Ah. That is obviously a passion of yours. Mm. So, I mean, tell me, how, how did it, you know, how did it all happen? Oh, well, with the singing, it's mm. um, something I've been doing from a very young age. Uh, I started singing in churches as a kid and then when I was at university I got involved with the Opera Society there and just one thing led to another I applied to music college and um, and they gave me a scholarship so I kind of went and that's maybe the turning point in my life there where if I hadn't got the scholarship I may have gone and done something else but um, but the music has been part of my life throughout all all my time at school I was always playing instruments and singing and and doing composition, things like that. So it's always been ever present. Mm. And whether it was going to be a career or not, only kind of crystallised when I was at university. But um, it's definitely a passion. But if you're talking about kind of man caves and yep. and things to do, I suppose inevitably when someone becomes a job, yeah. It, I mean, it's thankfully it's it's the kind of thing you do when it can stay as almost as a hobby sometimes when you're doing. Mm. It. Obviously, not all the time when I'm singing. It feels like a hobby, but um, mm. fortunately now and again it still does. But um, yeah. I think if you're talking about a space away from work, then I imagine my my relaxation kind of tends towards reading and film and that kind of art. Yeah. Um, so I think, although I live in London, so, you know, classic kind of small two-bedroom flat kind yeah. of vibe going on, so there's not really room for anything other than the basic rooms, but I think uh, in my mind there's a, a man cave that involves quite a big library. Yeah. Maybe a hidden television or something. You know. Okay. So what I can, I mean, what are we talking about? I mean, what what is the most interesting things that you've read recently? I mean, uh, what what were you really into? Because I I think with with uh, literature you tend to chain, don't you? One thing mm. that one thing you enjoy, you think, well, what else has that person written? Um, or what other genre? Do I want to look at that genre again or something like mm. that? So what is it at the moment that you're kind of looking at? I have a really um, big fascination with uh, 20th century American literature at the moment. Okay. So um, things like uh, uh, some sci-fi stuff like Philip K. Dick, uh, Kurt Vonnegut, uh, the classics like Catch-22 and uh, Catch on the Rye. Mm -hmm. One of my favourite authors at the moment is a guy called Paul Oster. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I've not yet to read it. It's sitting on my table, but there's a... Uh, oh, I've now 
forgotten the title of the book. That's terrible. But um, it's uh, it was on the Booker Prize list a few years ago. Okay. But he has another book, which is one of my favorite books. It's called the New York Trilogy, mm-hmm. and it's um, it's a very interesting uh, book. Three different stories. Yeah. All quite absurdist, but all with a quite a. So the short stories, or they are actually linked in the book. I would say medium stories okay. and connected by a theme of kind of observation and kind of the idea is kind of how we interlink but how kind of voyeuristic society is mm. it's, it's, so it has some quite, quite interesting themes i also tried a bit of uh t- um pynchon okay which I th- anyone who's tried his books will know is, i'm not familiar with is him. extremely hard going really and, okay um i managed to get through one of his books um catcher in the rye is supposed to be quite a yeah well, i mean that's uh kind of like a, a school classic isn't yeah. it? yeah right and I, I think people either find it, they find the main character unbelievably compelling or unbelievably annoying. It's hmm. kind of one of those kind of uh, love hate relationships. But yeah, mm. I think the uh, I think the last book I read was um, Ready Player One. Ah, uh, I've not read the book. Yeah, you need to read the book. Don't forget about the uh, well, completely I'm, forget I'm sure about the, the film. film. Is just so faithful, you know. Uh, as, as all, well, as do you all know? Hollywood films are well, you know. I mean. Uh, it's difficult it's difficult I think with the format um, it's sort of like it's it's sort of like this it's sort of like interviews Mm. the way that interviews have gone they're all short form and in a short form interview you can't really get it this is why the the emergence and why I kind of decided to kind of follow the long form of a podcast to Mm. actually have a proper conversation with someone in full context uh, from start to finish with uh, a book that's adapted to a 90 minute two hour um you know on screen experience they have to constantly cut corners make um make kind of compromises and that's when it all goes wrong and you're never going to be able to actually like um stay true to what's in someone's head and to be honest the adaptation i thought was not only i expected it to be semi different to what it was in my head absolutely but they actually changed elements of it because yeah. it was too geeky yeah. it was too dipped in the 80s um you know as for people that haven't actually seen it there's, there's like some of the trials that are in it um like one of the trials was uh in the book you um enter a, a cg world of ferris bueller's day off Oh, no, sorry, not Ferris Bueller's Day Off, War Games with Matthew Broderick. Oh, wow, okay, yeah. And mm. you have to reenact the whole thing, mm. like, from start to finish. Is that the one they switched with The Shining? Uh, now, I can't remember. I don't think they might have done. Yeah, they might have done, because I don't remember. No, actually, no, because The Shining, I think, was in the final ah, okay. in the final one anyway. That It was it was the, I think, the second one or something. Mm. They should, I think that... Uh, the, no, it was the first one. It was definitely the first trial because it was a dungeon originally in the book uh, and then they've made it like a race. Yeah. Um, like a Donkey Kong race or something like that. So anyway, it was... Um, but yeah, so, so it, is very diff- it is very difficult. But what I'm, I'm really enjoying at the moment is the um, uh, TV. Yeah. Long the, the form long TV. Long form TV adaptations are fantastic. Superb. I'm watching uh, on BBC at the moment, there's a adaptation of The Name of the Rose, which is um, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you just get so much more space to mm. to put out the actual whole story, and yeah, and you get to keep out. true to it. Mm. Uh, Watchmen started last. Ah, uh, yes, I've not I've not tried it yet, but it's uh, wow, it's mm. it it um it you know puts its stake out quite early as to this is not going to be an easy watch um <laughs> in it um <coughs> i must admit it was uh you know the, the opening scenes are quite shocking uh, which i'm not going to kind of like go into now but um mm. it is it's very well done it's been very um uh critically they, acclaimed they've basically taken a, a real life event sort mm. mm, sort of it's I, I don't know how i think i did look it up after but i'm not too sure mm, um it's very upon. twisted yeah it is yeah i kind of i can see where it's based on mm. but um not to the kind of level um the horrific level that it's actually depicted so but that's just to open it up and everything and then from then on it's it's um you know it's 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 worth watching again to actually see the world unfold in it but yeah it's good that's um that's it so you're 
the reading is the main thing. So the TV. What about the TV and films? What What are you kind of gravitate into? Um, you know, mm. are you going? Are you going to the old classics the same as are you with your books? Um, I I think I'm going through a bit of a phase of rereading things that I like, which is very. I mean, I do try and keep uh, new novels going and new films going as well. But mm-hmm. I think with the the current climate of this year, I think there's quite a lot to be said for a bit of. <laughs> comfortable nostalgia some, yeah or some <clears throat> some comic relief and i'm a, a big sucker for film wise for kind of 90s action films yeah so the, the diehards um that kind of stuff yeah diehard but kind of a bit of nicholas cage as well mm. air force one the fugitive <laughs> you know the classic harrison ford ones <laughs> yeah a couple of michael crichton things you know like yeah firm, firm stuff all like these that. kind of like long long story 90s movies which mm. come across a bit clunky yeah but Love them and just mm. kind of uh, rewatch those a bit. A, a lot of those guys that starred in that are getting old now. Yeah, I yeah. mean, like you know, I saw. Uh, you look at Harrison Ford in the Star Wars film. Uh, yeah, I mean, Harrison so. Ford, um, Arnie mm. is one of the old, one of the oldest guys in that kind of yes. genre, isn't he? And uh, I saw him. Um, I watched a UFC uh, thing the other day, and he was sitting in the audience, and everything. people were like coming and getting him stuff. Like, oh, so have you got this? And, it's just like, and he's just sitting there like the granddad of, of all action <laughs> and, and Hollywood stars, you know, mm. the, the maker of people like The Rock and people like that now. Um, yeah, and th- those guys are kind of like, you know, I'm kind of like, I don't really, I like the older, um, I like all those old forms ones because they were just very simple format. They were popcorn chewers. We want so much more from our characters now. Um but saying that, then they bring out something like John Wick, mm. which is just, <coughs> it's just murder porn. Mm. <laughs> and not the new films. Um, I've yet to see Joker, which I want to try and catch before it goes mm. out. But uh, I did see the um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yes. Which... See, this is, the, I've, oh, I just, I've heard this recommended so many times and I haven't seen it yet. I, I, I would recommend it. Mm. Another recommendation. It's, uh, mm. it, it's, um, it's really enjoyable. Mm. And I, and I, uh, there's a couple of film critics I like to listen to a lot, and one of them was less than enthusiastic about it. Okay. And so I was quite surprised. And I can understand his his thought process, if not to have too much of a spoiler, but there's a lot of tracking shots of people going to places. Mm. And I think that's kind of the point, because he's trying to show off the 60s Hollywood and yeah. the amount of money he spent on background yeah. must be ex- extremely expensive. Yeah. Um, you could say story-wise that having half an hour of the film of people just driving and walking is slightly over yeah. experience, but I kind of enjoyed and, it. And who the, the hell, walk, who walks in LA? Yes. <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> so everybody drives. I've never, if I see anybody walking on the street, it's like, well, you've broke down. You're just, uh, are you okay? You, it's either that or you're homeless. You know, that's, mm. what, that's, the, that's the kind of sense you get. Everybody's yeah. driving around. I've never made it to LA, but I was in um, Dallas. And yeah, we were staying in a hotel in the centre of town. And of course, being from England, we immediately walked out onto the street and mm. it felt like there had been a zombie apocalypse or something because yeah. most of the traffic in central Dallas is there's there are underpasses. Yeah. So on the road we were on, it was literally completely deserted. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's so strange. Some weird places like that. I mean, in Vegas, it's very similar as well because, you know, you walk along the street and you just go, why am I? On the street. Why is there nobody else walking along the street? Even from hotel to hotel, mm. if you see someone walking, it's like, what, what have you? Like, you know, it, it seems weird. It seems like, am I the only one that's doing this? I think it's because constantly there's shuttles, there's cabs, there's there's just. I think I think there might be four lanes either way on one kind of road mm. uh, to get down the strip and stuff. It's just it's just too big. America's so huge. Yeah. You've, no, how many times have you been now? Uh, three times. Is it the mainly East Coast that you went yes. to and then one to Dallas? So I did one trip which was um, a lot, very eclectic. It was a tour. So it was mm. um, Dallas, uh, Cincinnati, uh, St. Louis, mm. um, Michigan. So yeah, no, never on the West Coast, but there was some more central, like Chicago as well. Yeah. And then the other two times were just in, in New York. Mm. Uh, once for work, once for, once for to. It was my oh, it was next, wasn't it? So yeah, we used, yeah. Once for pleasure. Once for pleasure, once for work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you did you enjoy it? You enjoyed New York. Oh, I love New York. Yeah. And of course, you saw it. The best way to see New York is with people that live with in New, New York. York. Yeah. So the first time I went was uh, 
with my ex girlfriend who lived there. Yeah. And yeah, she showed me quite a lot of the secret places and stuff and got mm. to know. And then when I went for work, I had a good groundwork for, you mm. know, a good framework. Where were you when you went there for work? Where were you so based? So we were at, um, I think it's called BAM. The, it was, BAM. It was a Brooklyn Arts and Music Centre. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Which is literally just over the road from the Barclays Centre. Yeah, I've, is, I've been there. Mm, I which, have been there Well, because I stayed in, I stayed in um, Brooklyn last time I stayed uh, and I walked yeah. all around there mm. and uh, the museum, the... the yeah, so um, it's all it's in the big a, yeah. It's a museum, theatre, cinema, yep. it's all in the same place. That's it. And... Uh, being right next door to the Barclays Centre was when uh, I started getting interested in basketball. Ah. Because uh, the tickets for, for the Nets at the time were so cheap. Yeah. So I went, I think, four times yep. in the month I was there. So yeah, like once a week. Brilliant. Great fun. That's not a... I t- I've never been to that stadium. Mm. I, I went to New York the year that um, they opened... Sorry, but the Nets launched the, fir- the Nets first season, so everybody was like Nets crazy. Yeah. So all the New York Knicks fans, like my friends that are New York Knicks fans, are just like, "What the hell?" You know, why? You know, we, you're Knicks fans or not? And then everybody's suddenly supporting the Nets because Jay Z owns them and they've got a new center and everything. Yeah. Um, so I kind of like bought lots of kind of Nets gear and all Nets were cool. And then Nets haven't really performed the way that people have wanted. They're still a sexy team, but they've not really performed. Mm. And now. They've got this kind of lineup now where it's yeah. just like, oh, this is our time, and everybody's really buzzing about it over there. But I, I mean, don't really want to go. Although the Knicks still haven't really done much either. I don't know. I don't know. The thing is, it's the most. <coughs> the thing that gets me is it's the most lucrative franchise in the entire NBA, but it's got a terrible record. It's mm. got a very cons- inconsistent record. I mean, it has got championships for it in the amount of time it's been running, but. And it's got legendary players and things like that, but it's just it's just been so bad for so long. <laughs> I don't understand what it is about New York that's just not not clicking. Not with clicking. The players, yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't know. But I love it though. I'd, I'd go back tomorrow if I could. It's just uh, Brooklyn, especially, is so arty now. It's yeah. it's so say bohemic I suppose it's just yeah. everybody thinks they're an artist everybody thinks that they're kind of discovering something new um, every uh, every corner there is a new kind of quirky restaurant or cafe or a take on food or drink or something like that or music it's just yeah I think it's a it's a really cool place um, it feels touristy but it's it's funny because the tourists that are there <coughs> aren't tourists mm. so if, if you kind of understand what I mean, it's like when you see a tourist that's obviously from another country somewhere yeah. and you go, right, that's a tourist. These people, you're not from here, you're, but you're here and I bet you live here and you're from here and you see a lot of people that have come from all over the, the America, um, probably just as far as some of the, the international people, people. <laughs> yeah, and they're, they're actually them in Brooklyn and that's it. And they've they've almost become kind of residential tourists. Mm. Um, so it is, it is quite an interesting thing to see, a real melting pot. Yes. Uh, uh, so you're performing tonight. I am indeed, yes. Are, that's it. And you're feeling okay about that? Uh, well, as, he, as, he, as, he, as, right su- now, as he sucks on a, a you lozenge. You might be able to hear the, uh, the rapper being un- yeah. unfurled. For people on the podcast, the you can hear a rapper. For people on oh. YouTube listening, you can actually see him in, yeah. uh, um, taking part. We'll in see one. how it goes. But uh, yes, yeah, yeah, I am it should be fine. receiving, hopefully. I've, I've told the the team that I'm going to do it. So we'll yeah. see. It's not too much to do, so hopefully um, I'll get through it. But mm, you'll be fine. Sod's law, you know, that come home to sing and then get a cold. But you'll be absolutely yeah. fine. Mm. Absolutely fine. The um, so you also do a bit of gaming. We love mm. a bit. We love a bit of gaming here on the channel. I was mm. having the last conversation with, with my other friend Andy, and we started going in depth about everything. We've got PS Five released. Um, next year next Christmas right so that has been announced recently mm. so that's it um, I'm putting off buying a snazzy controller uh, for the sake of them upgrading the DualShock at the same yes. time have you seen these controllers like scuff controllers and all no that? no like back buttons it's mm. all about back buttons now so you know you can actually buy yeah, so you've got these paddles at the back. It's like an Xbox um, Elite controller. We got these paddles. So yeah. your, you know, your back buttons, which are here, or sorry, your back, your back buttons, which are on the thumb, yeah. um, they're actually on the back now. Oh. So you don't have to take when you're actually playing FPS or something like that. You're actually triggering your buttons here, 
and you're not taking your fingers off of them, so which is you, react much quicker. you can, yeah. I mean, I mean, you, can, you suppose you can aim and shoot all down mm. here as well while you're actually like still keeping on the thumb pads. I think that's that's fine, but um, I, I would definitely say for the for the face buttons, it actually works out quite well. Mm. But um, I've been playing a lot of Destiny. Mm. I'm back in. Oh, Number God. two, Destiny Two. Destiny Two, Destiny Two Shadow Keep more more, um, and it's the it's the first DLC without Activision. Bungie have gone it on their own. They've got so rid of Activision. Well, apparent. Well, it will be. I think they're going to be. They're going to tailor it more to the um, fans. It's free to play. Oh, okay. So you can download it. You can play it for free. Then all they just charge is the uh, DLC content. Mm. Um, but you can play as much as you want. Um, and then you just kind of like, you know, you can buy one DLC or, or two or something. And then suddenly you're back in the game with it all and that. that. Yeah. And uh, it's all free to download and all free to go at the moment. You should play with us. Ah, I'm part of a clan. I see. Well, I am horrifically casual at gaming at the moment. Horrifically casual. Like... Uh, this is not the game for you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is one where you just they drip feed achievement for mm. hours of putting into it. So I have, um, yeah, I'm I'm really, I'm not putting in the hours on the PlayStation, and I'm sorry to say it's mm. been a bit. Um, you were though. You were I kind was, of there quite. Was little, little there was point. a little stint there. Wasn't I think there? I think there was a stint where I was happily doing a, a show which I knew really well, mm -hmm. and so I could rest on my laurels and spend my spare time playing games. Whereas the last six months. My spare time has been spent with a score in hand, memorizing music, which will happen for another three weeks because I'm memorizing another opera for December. So, do you have kind of a study or something that you do that on? Is that kind of your workspace where, or you just take yourself away to yeah, casual areas? I mean, and, again, you know, don't have much space in London, but um, no. yeah, I, I tend to. Uh, Luckily, my my flat is fine for singing, and my na you know the neighbours aren't too fussed about. And I I stick to working hours. Yeah, but um, I tend to my my method is a lot of writing. Mm -hmm. So I write the, the lyrics over and over and over again. Yeah, and and then just repetition of singing as well. Okay. So I just use use the use my sitting room. Yeah. Um, so how do you deal with? Because you 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 sing in a lot of different languages. Mm. So how do you deal with? I mean, are you, are you becoming quite? Well versed in actually other languages because you do a lot of German, didn't you? I've heard you. Do yes. That. Well, not really. It's this kind of weird process of you can either learn the language, which is probably the easiest way of. Yeah. Uh, I can pronounce things very well, mm -hmm. so I've had enough language coaching that I know how all the words are pronounced. Yeah. But the the way I kind of do it is you go through translating it all. Mm -hmm. So with a, with a dictionary, the bits you don't know. So, but but I suppose my German is getting better. Right. But at the same time. It's not enough that if you gave me a piece of music with German, I wouldn't be able to just translate it for you off the cuff and tell you what it meant. I'd have to mm. spend some time prepping. Yeah. And I suppose the answer is to spend some time learning the languages, but it's, mm. I have to admit it's something that I've never been particularly good at. Really? Because you, okay, you lived, mm. uh, you did shows in Germany at one point, didn't yeah, you? Yeah. Well, I mean, did that, you find that you absorbed it a lot better? That was the time when I, my German improved the most. Yeah, I did mm. a four-month contract in, in Germany. Mm. And yeah, suddenly, well, when you're rehearsing in German and the director's giving you notes in German, I mean, the pressure is to yeah to really pick up on what you're what you're hearing. And so yeah, I it, I improved um, leaps and bounds in those four months. Mm. You've told me before as well that um, your career would take off a lot more if you were based in Europe. Is that is that this still the case? Um, I think so. It's just it's the the issue really is that. If you think about the way, I mean, any job works, you think about the supply and demand. Yeah. And the UK market for opera is, is very narrow. You've only got uh, four permanent opera houses in the mm -hmm. country. Yeah. Which means, and they employ, especially the opera house, tend to employ international singers anyway. Yeah. So you're looking at three places of work mm -hmm. and then the summer festivals. Yeah. And you think about the amount of singers who are in the country, which is quite a lot. And then you look at the quality of people doing work, which in Europe they would be, you know, too overqualified for. Uh -huh. So you find yourself auditioning against very, very, very experienced people. Yeah. Very early on, whereas in Europe, 
Germany, I think there's uh, over 80 opera houses. 80 mm. in comparison to four? Yeah. That's crazy. And uh, Italy and France as well have a few. Uh, but it's just, yeah, it's just the amount of productions being put on means that the chance of you actually being uh, used. Why do you think that? Why do you think that is? What is it our, is it our um, appetite for cult, that type of culture? Mm, I don't think, yeah. It's, oh. I think it's it's the, the market, you know, supply and demand. I don't think yeah. the market's there for people in, in Britain I think there's if you look at the history of opera especially there's a huge gap in in, in British opera history in kind of the Victorian era mm. where Italy France and Germany at that point have big composers like Verdi Wagner mm-hmm. you've got um, people like Dvorak and Ravel, yeah. people uh, in France and in England there really isn't a comparison it's the kind of our Gilbert and Sullivan moment yeah I suppose and until the kind of 1910, 1920s, when you get people like Vaughan Williams and Britain and right. Tippett. Yeah. It's when... Uh, there was kind of orchestral scores yeah, that kind of came through. Where a bit yeah. of classical English music kind of came back into the fore. Yeah. But that gap meant, I think, it meant that opera was taken away from the populace and into this kind of elite kind of mm. feeling. And whereas in Europe, everyone kind of... I mean, it's never been a... But it was put on a pedestal. Wasn't yeah, it? it was. It was kind of like it was kind of like a, a society thing, wasn't yes. it? Back in those days, mm. if like if someone actually managed to get a trip to the opera, mm. they were doing all right. And funny enough, I think it still is. It, it is in this country. People go yeah, because they think it's the, the posh thing to do. It, they think it's a bit but, bougie. Um, yeah, <laughs> and I, you know, I I, Which I disagree. Mm. From bo- actually going myself mm. to see you perform. Um, and I have seen when I was at school. I saw La Bohème and the Magic Flute, and uh, and it was good because the schools ran that trip to give you that exposure to show mm. you what it was about to give you that kind of like. And I thought it was brilliant. If, you know, if anything, it was you know the production and the, and the uh, the music and everything and the the theatre of it all was you know far more entertaining than just sitting on your ass watching you know, Coronation Street. Mm. So. So yeah, it was definitely worth doing. Um, I feel but, there's yeah. the, the the thing that that means high art struggles. I think it's uh, the same for ballet, modern dance, mm. opera, theatre, anything that's kind of slightly more highbrow. I suppose places that you kind of have to, as an audience member, you have to bring something with you in terms of understanding. Yeah. You can't just switch your brain off and sit mm. there and, and let it wash over. You need to yeah. engage with it on a on, yeah. on a, a level of intellect. Yeah, and that means it's challenging. Yeah, and, and obviously, you don't want that every night. You do want a night where you can just sit down in front of a game or yeah. watch a TV. But I think there's also convenience. That's the other. Yeah. That's the other level. Or mm. that's the other level. So, in London, it's more, far more convenient to go watch live theatre mm. easily. I mean, we've got one live theatre in Ipswich. You know, that that's really about it, isn't it? Yeah. I'm sure there are smaller. Oh, there's one other, isn't there? Uh, there's the Wolsey. But um, yeah, it's a trip out. It's all this kind of stuff. But what I really like at the moment and how I've actually consumed, um, you know, ballet, musicals, theatre, I've loved some of the theatre productions, is the NT Live production. Ah, yes. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, showing this stuff in, in um, cinemas now. I just went to see the Billy Connolly thing, which was brilliant, by the way, the, uh, the, the show. But having that broadcast out, mm. and yes, I understand, there is an older crowd in there yeah. but then mixed amongst that are younger people myself or even younger like the, the uh, people bring their kids people bring their grandchildren who actually get to experience that and and slowly it's just like well they won't associate it they'll associate it with a good night out yeah to actually watch that live theater production and probably actually go themselves i think that technological change which i'm just shocked it took so many years mm. to actually happen uh has, is really opening people's eyes to see yeah i agree and the, the quality of the shows and the things you can see on those live links is amazing to play devil's advocate slightly the argument against is that if people have access to so much kind of national theater mm. that it kind of stunts the growth of regional theater because yeah. why bother going to see a touring company when yeah you can go to the cinema and watch the national version yeah and what that basically says is that regional theater needs to be better yeah but there's not really any kind of funding in place or institutions no. in place here. Whereas, again, in Europe, a lot of the regional areas have their own theatres, their own opera houses, their own mm. culture kind of set up already. Yeah. Whereas, as you say, in Ipswich, 
I think the Wolsey's there. But the Wolsey think... in the region, I suppose, yeah. that's about it, I think. Mm. Um, they do have, you know, they do have a lot of amateur production mm. things like that. But again, you know, I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone. You know, you, you've you got to spend your time and money to actually go yeah. something. You're going to watch a licensed product, approved thing, um, uh, you know, a show, something like that. A tour. And there is touring shows with big licenses. I find yeah. as well that touring shows... Um, with the big licenses, so I watched um, the Simon and Garfunkel story. Mm. It was very entertaining. It's great, and I was looking at the the program and the history of it, and they've been everywhere, and it's changed different people and everything like that. And it's just just that license to actually go and bring people in, but the place was half full. Yeah, you know, it wasn't a sellout crowd or anything like that. And you just think, well, hmm. but it shows if there's not a demand for it, then what can you do? Exactly. I mean, people talk about education in schools and things, and but. If the culture doesn't want it, then yeah. you're never going to fill places out if, mm. if, if it's not what people want. Mm. And you, I feel a lot of that's down also to the way popular music is, has, has gone over the last 20, 30 years. Mm. It has created a particular sound world. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say it's bad or good, but... It's I'm not for say, you. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not, you know, it's not for me. Um, but at the same time, I'm not going to sit here and, and be, you know, the, the guy who's going, oh, uh, terrible, blah, blah, yeah. Blah, blah. But what I will say is that if, if you look at it from a musical perspective, mm. it's very simplistic. Yeah. And 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 very much in a, in the same world, every song tends to be in a very similar place. Yeah. Which means people who just listen to that become very accustomed to a certain type of sound. Yeah. Which means that they're not really open to more complicated music. Mm. And... That's why it comes back to that. You need to bring something with you to something more complex to enjoy it. Mm. And if you sit there expecting the same amount of effort listening to the pop music as you do the classical music, you won't appreciate the classical music because it will seem in- incomprehensible. Yeah. So it's 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 a it's a difficult you know a difficult balance. I don't I don't think opera will ever be unbelievably popular in Britain. No. But I mean, hopefully, it will just maintain. There have been there have been some smash through. Mm. Um, people like Pavarotti. Um, oh yeah, uh, you know soundtracks that have been used um, in um, like major sporting events have gone on and things like that. I think uh, uh, there was a recent cover, wasn't there? One about Ed Sheeran's "Beautiful," but that was done by. Oh, I, I'm, I'm terrible. I should really get my facts right on it. It was uh, by a very well-known Italian opera singer. Oh, was okay. it Bur- Bocelli? Um, oh, Andrea, the, the, Andrea Bocelli. Bocelli. Yeah, Andrea yeah, Bocelli. He's not, this is again. This is another issue, which is he's not really an opera singer. Oh, um, he sang in operatic. He sings with, style. A, with vibrato. You're right. Okay, but I don't think he's ever actually been in an opera. Oh. so this is a this is another a grey world mm-hmm. of. Uh, Pop crossover, as it's called. So there is pop crossover in mm. the opera world as well. Oh yeah, if if, if you're an opera singer who, or and in the singer. classical as well, mm. you do you know, like Andre, Andre Rue, for yes. example. You we've we've mentioned this before. It's kind of like the the pop version of classical mm. music, isn't it? Yeah, and it's basically what they you doing is you're simplifying the music mm. to make to to make it more palatable. Yeah, and. Uh, and so you'll hear people like Catherine Jenkins or Alfie mm. Berg. Yeah. So they'll sing folk songs or they'll sing, maybe put in one opera aria. Yeah. Because they sing nowhere near as well as a, a full-on opera singer. Right, okay. And they'll, uh, yeah, and, and because it's marketed and packaged and it's put on these, on Classic FM and stuff like that. Yeah. It means it's it, it, it reaches a wider audience. Yeah. The trouble is if you then try and do that with some kind of, if you try to do that with a production or with a, a more cerebral piece of music, people yeah. wouldn't latch on to it so yeah it's, it's all about the marketing really do you not think though that almost that could be for some people a gateway mm. into a love of the real stuff yeah and, and again it's that kind of thing of it if it serves a purpose of people going well i like this and i'll see what else i like yeah okay, good but there's also the people who will stay on the surface and then just okay. assume everything they listen to will be like that mm. So it's it's about I think it's about delving deeper and, and mm. finding more interesting things. And I think the most the best thing in in Britain for that kind of experience I think is the proms. Yes. And I think they are very good at that kind of. They now do some some kind of halfway house proms. Yes. Yeah. Like film music or yeah or the um or the MGM classics mm. things like that. 
which are really entertaining, but mm. they also, I think, it lends to people then to go, well, what else is there on the programme? Yeah, absolutely. There's some amazing, amazing musicians on that, yeah. on that programme. I would love to go to that. I've mm. never been. Uh, I think David um, went um, many, a uh, couple of years ago, I think it was, and he was just blown away by mm. it. Now, you know, David's not, he's not a massive music fan or anything really he's a, he's a football fan that's about it I think um, but um, yeah even he said he was just blown away by it it's a real spectacle mm. I think there's an element to classical music which people don't realise is, is, the, is the live element there's it's it's never transferred onto 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 whatever medium in terms of recording it never transfers as well as, as pop music does into a recording yeah so once you hear a full orchestra playing full pelt in in person yeah the effect is so much more powerful it really is yeah mm. in, a, in a good acoustic setting as mm. well i think uh, when i first heard you sing it was uh, in the church down here um uh, st. Yes. was it st andrews no yeah uh st yeah, yeah, St. St. Andrews, Andrews because yeah. it was on St. Andrews Road. Yeah, of course. And uh, I think there was only a, um, was it a quartet? Um, mm. There was only a couple of instruments in there, but that filled, and then you sang, I think Richard Revel sang as well, mm. and it just filled, and everybody was kind of in it. Like, they were kind of, I was like, is this, this is in it. This is like, I feel like I'm part of this. This is, you know, it's it's a real, it's a real sense of, uh, I suppose you get it with a lot of live music, but mm. it's just when, when you actually think that, those five people, uh, six people that are actually standing in front of you are just kind of like, they are creating this entire mm. thing around me right now. Um, it, is quite, it is quite amazing. So it is, it is worth checking out, definitely. Mm. Where would you suggest then? Okay, so I would like to think that people that actually are into opera, they've kind of like, they've, they've seen the description of this podcast and gone, oh, opera, I'm quite in, right. Where would they kind of start what would you say is a good place to start? I know everybody, it's very personal and everything like that, mm. but you would probably say like a good base of, I want to know more about opera. Um, mm. How, you know, what would you kind of guide them to? Because um, you're at the top end, obviously, so you'd have to kind of like think back to square one. Well, <laughs> I mean... It's uh, it's a tricky question, as you say. Or enjoyable but, operas to actually mm. go see. Ones that aren't, I mean, I watched the... Um, what was it? The uh, the Merry Wives of Windsor mm. with, with you, which was good, but that was a play, wasn't yeah. it? Which is adapted into an opera. Yeah. Um, but I would probably say, like, what would you say is the entry level if you can get a show? I, I would look. say the best ones to go for in terms of operas is is, is going for the Romantics, mm, okay, and Italian Romantics. So, mm. my personal favourite to suggest as an entry level is Puccini. Okay, Puccini, because. Uh, the one thing opera sometimes fails to do particularly well is is give you a believable story throughout, mm -hmm. and composers can focus on the music a lot more, and yeah. you get beautiful singing, but yeah. you're sometimes like, well, that's not very realistic. Right. You look at something like Cosi Fan Tutte, mm -hmm. which is one of Mozart's most beautiful operas. Yeah. But the storyline just does not hold up to a, for a modern audience, so you're always kind of playing against the fact that you're never quite in the story because it's all a kind of classic, you know. Um, uh, from the, t at the at the time, it was a very kind of popular theatre trope of people, you know, disguising themselves as so and so, and mm. obviously the other people not recognising them, and it's all a bit ridiculous. Okay. Whereas uh, Puccini takes, I think he's one of the op op operatic composers. He wrote a lot of his librettos as well, mm. where he takes pain to create a dramatic story as well. Right. So something like Tosca. Yeah. Or. He did a set of three short operas, which are also all very beautiful. Yeah. One of them particularly very funny called Gianni Skiki. It's okay. a very good starting point as well. Yeah. Uh, with Mozart as well, I think Marriage of Figaro is a timeless classic for the music. It's just got so many beautiful moments. Okay. And uh, yeah, yeah, and then you just build, I think you either go backwards to Handel and a bit yeah. more kind of frilly. Yeah. Or you... Uh, get even more dramatic and hit things like Wagner and Strauss. And but you find that once you actually get hooked in to mm. something that you've really enjoyed, I mean, I find, I Google straight away, okay, well, what, where, you know, where's that artist? What, what has that artist done? Mm. Um, who else was on that, which I actually particularly liked? Um, and you kind of uh, segue all the way in, don't you? Um, I've done that with quite a bit of music as mm. well, but um, with, with kind of like that, you know, that genre 
I will definitely be going back and actually having a look at that now and just going, oh, maybe I'll have a look at this. Because you can get a lot of this stuff online as well, can't yes. you? You can yeah, see yeah. a lot on YouTube and stuff mm. and and, uh, and experience it. But there's nothing better than actually experiencing it yeah, live. And it's, again, it's almost like we're like watching the rugby today. Yeah. You can watch it on telly, but you can't get the full scope of what these people are actually doing unless you watch them on the pitch. And it's the same with singers. You watch a soprano belting through something yeah. huge on stage. Yeah. and It's almost kind of... It's unbelievable that the, the amount of noise and, and purity of sound someone can make in front mm. of you. Whereas you watch it on a video, it's mm. kind of, it, it's, you kind of almost half expect the, the, the sound. Who's the uh, last artist that you've seen live that has just blown you away? Ooh. Um, oh, that's a good question. Uh, I would probably say I went and saw a production at the Opera House of Agrippina. Okay. And there's a very famous uh, American mezzo soprano called Joyce De Donato. Yeah, and she was amazing. How how long has she been? Uh, she's um, she's been around for a while. I I, I I wouldn't want to guess her age. I'm sure no, she would. Want yeah, to yeah. Do that. But um, she's had a long career. She's, she's quite, quite career. seasoned. Yeah, I would say singer. seasoned, but not over seasoned. Good. You know, in the prime, not too much and, pepper. Uh, she just dramatically. She's a, tr- a true actress, right? And uh, and sometimes is with with the voice as well, especially with opera. You get good singers. Yeah, and it sounds nice. But, yeah, but without the emotion behind it, it doesn't have the power. Okay. And with her, she's one of those singers where everything has intention, where everything has emotion and drama behind mm. it. So regardless of the sound, you feel the the pain and the passion and the joy mm. of the character. Yeah. And that comes through so clearly that it's, yeah. it's, you can't fail to be moved a bit. Yeah. And she was fantastic. Yeah. So this is because there's there's twofold to an actual performance, isn't there? It's not just about someone like you know getting up, putting a mic to mm. it. It's the performance as well because there's acting. There's yeah. a lot of acting mm. involved in 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 opera. But I mean, there's the it's it's very much part, the part of of the the art form that's evolved. Mm. And you go back twenty, thirty years to when you think about people like Pavarotti. Yeah, and they would come on stage, sing beautifully, maybe not move about very much, mm. and then go off again. Yeah. And that just isn't what people want anymore. Mm. And so the amount of movement and direction and sometimes crazy direction that people yeah. put them through, like uh, uh, I saw her, someone having to sing a very difficult aria whilst kind of almost cartwheeling around the stage. <laughs> cartwheeling? Pretty much. Being the cart? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that, that was something else? <laughs> yeah, something else. Yeah. But, um, cartwheeling around stage, the, wow. The amount, I mean, you I wouldn't call up singers triple threats. I mean, the dancing is usually pretty abysmal. Yeah. But definitely at least the the acting side has improved so much. Mm. And although it's difficult because obviously you think about the conceit of, obviously you're already suspending your belief because mm. people are singing everything. Yeah. So I like theatre where, you know, well, you say that, but I mean, musical theatre. Yeah, well, same thing there. Which, yeah, which, people flock to musical mm. theatre. There's a real, oh, there's a real appetite for it at the moment, mm. like crazy. I mean, it, I, I think, um, oh, I saw, uh, I saw Aladdin. So I saw the Disney film Aladdin, mm. which is awful. Uh, <laughs> just spoiler, don't watch it. <laughs> How about that? Um, it's terrible. And but the thing is, uh, it was constantly attempting to basically make a West End show like The, La- the Greatest Showman. Um, yeah. There was even, you know, a a set pop piece of music right in the middle of it, which was obviously um, to, to match. Charts, yeah, yeah, so they, they want to chart with it. And it just, it kind of felt, it didn't feel right. It felt, it didn't feel organic. And, and like I said, there is so much of that now. There's there's so much kind of appetite for it, but yeah, with acting, it's just like well, you don't need to. Act. You just sing as mm. long as you've got as long as you've got a whole thing of of, of singing, um, then uh, then people will actually be happy with it. Yeah, so, but I don't know about that. I'm not I'm not a, I'm not a huge musical fan. Um, not mm. of of West End musicals and that genre. Um, I have seen quite a few, but. I don't know. I can take it or leave it I've, myself. I've, I, the only two that I've been brought in by were the, the comedic ones, was, which were the producers, yes, and the Book of Mormon. Yes. Now those two I could get on board movie. with. Yeah. I think I've never quite got. I just never. It's never a, a genre that has grabbed me dramatically. Mm. The type of singing I've just when it's the kind of the heartfelt stuff. It's, mm. just, it's not how I 
picture mm. that emotion whereas a comedy the comedy side of it i think it works very well but, yeah mm. so do you when you actually like because obviously you're in um these operas these productions these stories um when you break it down you kind of like obviously when i'm kind of taking it in um a lot of it is in other languages sometimes there's subtitles which i try not to, w- to watch too much because mm. it kind of takes you out of what's going on yeah but do you kind of like see it as like it's a story rather than just set pieces of music this is where pieces of music do you kind of approach it like it's a play oh definitely yeah so it's more of a play to you mm. than an actual musical performance um so. i think as in terms of developing a character yeah you definitely mm. Although there's there's some it's a difficult this again there's so many different methods that people use but mm. to personally yeah definitely think about it as a as a as an ongoing narrative mm. you also have to be aware whether your character is aware of that narrative or not yeah yeah there's no point reacting to something later on if your character is not going to have any idea that it's going to happen so. mm. but yeah I think it's it's definitely on the kind of the play side of things yeah and um, yeah continuity and making sure that it all links together is very important rather than set pieces and kind of like this is an aria that's going to happen now that's own, its own little thing mm. I think in films that's important as well you see films where it's like this is a big set piece but it doesn't tie in yeah and it just like you say it feels contrived well I mean I watched I watched uh, <coughs> I think it was La La Land okay obviously mm. musical but it wasn't the thing that t- yeah music was great it's fun it's like jumpy it's, it was a production it was kind of a play on the old vaudeville yeah. type productions which I think is fine and everything but the root of it, it was quite an interesting story. It that's the part that got me. It was mm. kind of like the underlining story of uh, two aspiring artists uh, in uh, which is you know the 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 grinder that is um, Los Angeles, and how their relationship and lives have kind of like taken mm. off. And I felt that was. You know, I keep saying to people, "Oh, I don't really like musicals." I said, "Well, it is a musical, but it's not a musical." I said, "It is yeah. a good film." So there are musicals there are good films which have music in them. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's kind of, you know, and so I, I kind of always go back to that. of just like, if there's a good story, <coughs> if you could actually explain through a musical what the story mm. was about, which was actually more compelling than a lot of the individual score, yeah. then they're onto a good thing, really, because you've, you know, mm. it, the narrative's been there. And stems from the fact that they're homaging all these amazing people. Mm. And they're homaging them with really poor dance scenes. Like mm. there's a tap scene with uh, yeah, the, the two leads. The moonlight one. And it looks like they've just done like their grade two tap exam. <laughs> and they're homaging like all the greats of the 50s, 60s who are like, you, some of the best dancers of all time. We could, like, yeah. Yeah, you may you may have wanted to up your game a bit. Yeah, you do know as well that um, even though that Ryan Gosling did mm. learn the piano, especially for the piece, um, on I think second or second to- uh, looking uh, my uncle Richard who I'm going to get on this as well and talk about jazz which he'll, he'll chew my ear off about uh, massive jazz fan and kind of like looking at it yeah but the jazz isn't very good in it the jazz isn't very good it's very poppy and it's mm. not really and it's supposed to be about this hardcore jazz artist but he said he doesn't play like one yeah and, and I was just like oh right okay he plays pop music and stuff so mm. again it's that kind of like thing of like you're changing people's uh, perception of it um, well you're sorry you're you're warping someone's perception of what they see as that genre it's like oh this is a jazz artist mm. no it's not that's a pop artist well the film he should watch by the same director is uh, Whiplash yes uh, we have watched Whiplash mm. um, together and that is it's fantastic hardcore hardcore mm. that is and I remember watching that with a non-musician friend of mine and then really? we were left and they were like well I enjoyed it but it was so unrealistic no one would ever do that and I was, I was just like what? Yeah, well, you're joking, right? New York, I've, Julia. I've, I've, I've I think been so. in a rehearsal where someone's literally thrown a chair at someone because they weren't getting it right. But that's and it. Think, and you think that's and you know, you think he's going over the top, and it's uh, yeah. But there's passion. But there's passion, isn't it? And it's, yeah. Yeah, fight. It, I mean, I love the the idea of the film was that how far is too far in creating yeah. something beautiful. Yeah. And whether. <laughs> even psychological damage is, is justified when you yeah, create but it, something amazing which that's, that's the problem but, that's not yeah. a great message when you actually come to the end of it mm. and yeah the, the, the final scene and things like that it's just like I don't know whether that's a good moral story because because no. I mean that was horrific but again like a good film leaving it open for you to decide as well like yeah absolutely yeah um, I really enjoyed that film I just I sat here and watched it on